call this meeting of the annual town meeting of Arlington to order. Just start with some opening remarks. Okay, let's settle down. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's quiet down, everybody. Okay. First, I want to share that when we take up Article 31, a zoning bylaw amendment for industrial district animal daycare use, which may be tonight, I'll be recusing myself from moderating that article. My dog makes use of a dog walking service provided by a local business that offers dog daycare services that could be affected by the outcome of that article. As a result, the assistant town moderator, Mr. Oster, will take the chair for that article, unless he has a dog that makes use of daycare services. Second, a quick announcement about the order of articles for Monday, May 15th. In order to allow the Audison students who proposed Article 56 for an appropriation for subsidized compost collection to appear on Monday evening, which is a school night, we'll be taking that article first if the meeting votes to accept a motion to do so. So expect to start out Monday night with that article. Third, I wasn't explicit about this previously, so let me be explicit now. Going forward, we will not be allowing handouts on seats. That tends to create more clutter and work during cleanup after the meeting based on our past experience. Next, I want to talk briefly about the institution of town meeting. This institution is a vehicle for translating the will of the people into certain kinds of decisions and actions that affect the town and its residents and local businesses. Passion is a topic that came up Monday night. Passion is like rocket fuel. It provides the power and the drive that we need to get things done that are difficult and important. And for this institution to function effectively, each of us needs to transform the raw rocket fuel that sloshes around inside us into cogent arguments that persuade rather than inflame. That's what deliberative democracy is at its core. And inside this chamber is one of the purest forms of deliberative democracy that still exists on this planet. And if we're not careful, if we're not disciplined, that fuel inside us can catch fire, spread, and destroy what took generations of, of sacrifice to build and preserve. I do my best to keep those fires from catching and spreading inside this chamber, but I cannot do it alone. No moderator can. It requires cooperation and buy-in from all of you. That's the only way that this institution will persist. It's the main reason that it's persisted as long as it has. And next time, I'll try to come up with a more eco-friendly metaphor based on green energy somehow. Okay, that's enough lecturing from me. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce a special guest tonight. Charlie Martin is a freshman at Arlington High School where she is a member of the Arlington High School Concert Choir and Bella Voce Vocal Ensembles and the Drama Guild. She will lead us in the singing of our national anthem. Please rise.
Great, thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, Mr. Helmet. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Select Board. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 15th, 2023, at 8 p.m. We have a second? Okay. All those in favor of, if we don't finish tonight, adjourning until Monday, May 15th at 8 p.m., say yes. yes. All those opposed? It, is, it, is, uh, it passes. Is, is a majority vote. Uh, now we will take a test vote. Okay, if, if, you, if you believe that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides in the Euclidean two space, vote yes. If you disagree with that statement, vote no. If you're unsure, you can abstain. Okay, the yeses have it. Okay, check for your votes to make sure that it registered correctly. Okay, so Okay, now I ask for any announcements or resolutions. Do we have any announcements or resolutions, Mr. Pooler? Sandy Pooler, town uh, manager. I guess I'm a funny town manager. <laughs> um, on uh, Thursday, the 18th, the health department is hosting a, a rodent forum. That's about rodents, not for rodents. <laughs> As spring uh, is uh, well upon us now, I think a lot of us uh, would, are having to deal with rodents. I know I am in my own backyard. And uh, this will be a forum about how to control rodents on your property uh, without using uh, dangerous pesticides, uh, other techniques, and so forth. It will be from 5.30 to 7.30 here in Town Hall. Great. Thank you. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions today? Um, Mr. Warden? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Moderator, um, <coughs> I, uh, last um, uh, la last week or maybe week before, we, we, we passed a home rule amendment asking the legislature to let us discontinue the uh, publication of legal notices from the town uh, in the in the in a so-called local newspaper, and uh, so I thought I would call up the so-called local newspaper and see if maybe telling them that news would get them to pull their socks up. Um, but the, the woman I got on the phone seemed not at all distressed, and I pointed out that a full page of legal ads puts quite a bit of revenue in their pockets, 
And she said, well, you have to speak to somebody else. I said, let me speak to him. Well, I'm sending him a message right now. Uh, he doesn't take calls, but maybe he'll return your call. But we can't promise a return call. Well, when the, uh, the phone didn't ring, I knew it was him. <laughs> so um, apparently they're not even willing to talk to somebody about the possibility that they might want to give put a lo local news in a local newspaper. So I, I thought the town, I know there's some, some derogatory remarks about the advocate and star, uh, and I share that sentiment. Um, so I thought you'd like to know that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions? Have a hand in the back. Uh, Steve Moore, Precinct 18. Uh, following John Warden is always a pretty tough task. So um, I have an announcement to make tonight. Probably none of you can see. Probably none of you can see that. Ah, all right. I did get it up on time. We have just we have just begun the uh, adopt a tree program for 2023. The Arlington Tree Committee annually puts together this program to hopefully garner a significant number of volunteers to water the newly planted trees in town. Uh, since April 1st, we planted 150 brand new trees. Also on that list is two years more of uh, previously planted trees. They all need help in watering. The town does its best to keep up with this, but these trees are all planted near your homes, near where you live. So hopefully volunteering to water uh, these trees by putting water in the gator bag, that's how we do it, at least once a week, uh, would, would help hugely in keeping these young trees alive and growing the Arlington tree canopy, which we're all working on so hard. So. If you're interested, please go to the arlingtontrees.org website, which is uh, where we have all the links to our various programs, including the uh, Tree Canopy program, which has also begun this year. We are just finishing up that program, which is providing subsidized trees to people uh, in town that are interested in putting them in their front yards. Um, and there's some trees left if you're interested in that program, but I'm particularly interested in promoting the adopted trees. So please help us if you can. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any, <laughs> are there any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, uh, I call for reports of committees. I see no hand from Mrs. De Ms. Deschler, so we will move on. Ms. Deschler? Um, oh yeah, so Article 3 is still on the table. Uh, so now we resume Article 12 tonight. And so the speaker queue is not restored in the form that you can see it, but I do have a picture from my phone from Monday night, which I will be using. Uh, I don't think we have an easy way to actually show that, um, but it's the same list that you probably saw uh, for about an hour of debate on Monday. Uh, so I'll be going through those names in order. If we get to the bottom of my screen, shot, then, uh, then we will open the speaker queue at that point. All right, so next up is Ms. Kelleher, which I believe she did not have the opportunity to speak. Okay, she passed. Uh, Mr. Hallman. Aaron Holman, Precinct 6. Um, I rise to support the Malovchik substitute motion, uh, unmitigated, unmoderated, and unmixed by any of the other various substitute motions. All of them have various defects. I will not enumerate them, except for one, that many of them will split that motion into a study committee and a moratorium such that one might go forward without the other, and I want both. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holman. We'll take Ms. Pyle next. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Pyle, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 8. My 10-year-old daughter plays soccer, 
And I would love to have more well-draining soccer fields in town for our kids. My daughter's two soccer practices last week were canceled because of the heavy rain, and that was frustrating. But I will be voting in favor of the original Malofchek substitute motion to have an artificial turf study group and a moratorium. The emerging science tells us artificial turf fields may not be safe, and the responsible thing to do is to look before we leap. It would be a tragedy if we installed more artificial turf just as science is coming to the conclusion that it causes harm to players and the environment. This is why we need more study, to pause and evaluate the science before we make a decision that cannot be reversed. I, I support the original Malofchek substitute motion, unadulterated by the other motions. I do not support the Back Hill Amendment on PFAS testing for artificial turf because I think this is something the study group should decide as part of its work, and I'm also not confident that the listed standards in that amendment are correct. I do not support the other amendments because, although well-intentioned, I am persuaded that they do not improve the Malofchek motion, and I don't want to split our decision on whether to pass a study group or a moratorium because we need both. I also do not support taking no action so that the town manager appoints a study group, although I very much appreciate that he is willing to do so and that he agrees further study is the right thing here. However, as the legislative body of the town, I think it is important that town meeting act because Mr. Pooler is retiring in a few months, which leaves a question about what happens after he leaves, and also because the study group should report directly to town meeting to ensure the most objectivity and neutrality. More study of this issue and a moratorium are necessary so that we can make sure we get this right, given the most recent emerging science on the dangers of PFAS. Now that Belmont Hill School has determined that the Poets' Corner is not right for them, a study group and a moratorium should be an easy decision for us. Now, I've heard people ask whether we need to study this because they think that if artificial turf was causing cancer or other health problems in our kids, there would be lawsuits already and we would know about it. But I'm a lawyer and that's not how the legal system works. It takes a very long time for enough evidence to be collected to proceed with a successful toxic harm lawsuit against a product manufacturer. And the facts that lawsuits have not been decided yet on this issue does not mean a product is safe. We all know that there are many products that were thought to be safe at first, but then it was scientifically determined later on that they were harmful to human health and the environment. Cigarettes, asbestos, thalidomide, the drug to prevent morning sickness that caused severe birth defects, PCBs, DDT, the pesticide that made bird eggs break, and BPA, an endocrine disruptor in plastics. Here, Arlington should follow the precautionary principle, which means that if a product has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or the environment, protective action should be supported even before there is complete proof. That's what I support here. The original Article 12 substitute motion sensibly and reasonably calls for an impartial study group and moratorium so that we can examine the recent scientific evidence on PFAS before we make a mistake that could harm kids and the environment. There are lots of signs around town that say, in this house, we believe in science. I believe in science. Arlington is a community that believes in science. But we can't just believe in science when it's easy, like banning the sale of single-use water bottles or plastic bags. We can't just believe in science when it impacts other people, like implementing the energy stretch code for new construction. As a community, we have to believe in science even when we make difficult choices. As a community, we don't want to be on the wrong side of history with this decision. We don't want to install artificial turf fields right as emerging science determines that they are toxic, and then we have to get rid of it. And if our community believes in science and wants to do its part to stop climate change, we should carefully consider whether we actually want to replace natural grass with plastic. 
Please support the original Malofchek substitute motion so we can carefully and impartially examine the emerging science on this issue and make the best choice for the health of our athletes, our climate, and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pyle. We'll take Ms. Hansen next. Actually, while, while Ms. Hansen's walking, you can come up. Um, can we bring up the slide that I shared? Uh, that just, it just shows the names and the ordering uh, so folks have those in mind of because the debate. We want to be able to cover uh, all aspects of all these motions. And so any motions that don't get spoken to, um, we don't want to get into a position where folks aren't really sure what that's doing. So let, let's try to cover as much as we can, which is a collective action problem. But, you know, let's do the best we can. Thank you. Ms. Hansen. Linda Hansen, Precinct 9. Good evening. Before I start my comments, I want to thank Krista Kelleher for the letter she submitted in relation to this article. Several of the points I'm going to make are taken directly from her letter with her permission. I want to start by saying that I have close personal experience with the issue of field adequacy and availability. I coached boys soccer for 13 long years in the all grass era, so I know firsthand what it's like to vie for limited practice space and attempt to reschedule games with limited options due to weather conditions. I've been there. With this week's withdrawal of the Belmont Hill proposal and the recent recommendation by the town manager of a study committee, the landscape for this article has somewhat shifted. It looks like no matter, no matter the outcome of the vote, we will have a study committee and pass or fail, we no longer have the Belmont Hill Poets Corner offer and commensurate deadline hanging over our heads. Whether these developments are welcome news or not, they do give us a little more breathing room to hopefully regroup and figure out how to come together to address the field needs in our community. The factors in question, as I see them, are what is the best composition of the study group? Is voting or non-voting membership important to determine? What is the charge of the group and the scope? What is the deadline for the work? Should there be a turf moratorium in place while this work happens? And who will the committee report to, the town manager or town meeting? There's certainly a lot to consider here. It seems imperative that to do this work well and in a way that helps us pull together instead of apart, we need to develop a shared understanding of the issues related to the use of artificial turf and the equally significant question regarding how we're going to tackle challenges related to addressing our field needs. I'm a big fan of interest-based bargaining. In that process, you start by trying to identify shared interests that both sides can agree on and want to work together to solve. Often that process begins with a statement of shared values. Let's consider the values that I think are likely shared by most, if not all of us here, and reflect those of our community. Residents of Arlington highly value recreational areas and open spaces for being outdoors, and engaging in outdoor activities. Children and teens, even adults, receive vital physical, mental health, developmental, and social benefits from sports, athletics, and outdoor activities. Residents of Arlington highly value the protection and conservation of our environment and are not only concerned, but proactive on the issue of climate change. Our town is a leader among mass communities when it comes to sustainability and conservation. It also seems necessary to recognize a few points on process and current conditions. There are not enough fields to meet the current and anticipated future needs and interests of children, teens, and adults in Arlington. Arlington has limited space for installing new fields. The current town manager has put a turf moratorium in place until he leaves at the end of his contract. While Arlington can look to and learn from what other communities and institutions have done, it need not be a follower of others, but should do what seems appropriate and responsible for the town, given the conditions, resources, needs, and values of the community. Due to the high school rebuild, the AHS fields have been offline. When they come back online in the near future, we will have two additional turf fields in our collection. And very importantly, to date, we do not seem to have undertaken or commissioned a comprehensive study and or analysis of the conditions of, adequacy of, or maintenance needs of our town's fields. Nor do we have a proposal for field development and cost analysis to address field needs, including present and future needs. 
I reached out to both Parks and Rec Director Joe Connolly and the Capital Planning Committee to ascertain if there was a study out there and learned there was not. We do have such a study for the town's playgrounds and town meeting has been approving the renovation and major remediation of town playgrounds to the tune of $500,000 per playground for several years now, drawing on a variety of funding sources. I mention this because I think the need for investments in our fields is real, but without a comprehensive plan, it's hard to build a coalition to support the long-term investment it will take to improve the situation and meet our current and future needs. With such a plan in place, we have many sources of funding that could be tapped for major field investments, capital planning, community preservation act, CDBG, general funds. Town meeting has jurisdiction for the stewardship of five and a half square miles of our fragile planet. The science regarding artificial turf is evolving and complex. Without going into the many health and environmental issues raised to date, it seems reasonable to have a dedicated and varied group of individuals with expertise in the health and environmental impacts of turf and grass fields take a hard look at the evidence and develop recommendations. Financial considerations should also be considered and reported on in any study committee that is established. Finally, it seems that it would be beneficial for the town to conduct a thorough and comprehensive study of the state of our fields, including data regarding usage and unmet needs and a cost analysis for what it would take to better maintain what we have and what we would need to fund appropriate replacements, upgrades, and additional fields, field resources in the future. When the votes are all counted, whichever way it goes, we will have a study committee and a de facto pause on any major field projects in the near future. As a town and as a legislative body, I hope we can come together to make smart decisions that keep in mind our desire to increase field capacity while also being good stewards of our open space. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henson. We'll take Mr. Newton next. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. I move to terminate debate on Article 12 and all items, many items. <laughs> We have, we have a second for a motion to terminate debate. Uh, we have a second, right? Yes. Um, we have we still have a second. Uh, so we'll try this by voice vote, see how that goes. Um, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 12, and I believe all matters before it, uh, vote uh, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. I don't think we have it. Okay, we have, one, we have five. Okay, let's go to an electronic vote. And just to be really clear, this uh, folks are still clicking into the speaker queue. I think voting is not open. Um, this is about terminating debate on all the motions that are pending. Because we're going to have one big debate, and then we're going to go through the sequence that we had up on the screen of motions for votes. So if you, want, if you wish to terminate debate and go straight to voting, press 1 for yes. If you want to continue debate, press 2 for no. And vote three for abstain or present. Okay, let's close voting. It passes. Okay, 156 in the affirmative, 61 in the negative, with four abstentions. Okay, debate is terminated. So let us now bring up the, uh, let's bring up that, that graphic again. We're gonna see a lot more of this. We're probably gonna bring this up between each vote. And so we're gonna start with uh, the Vakil Amendment. And let's see. And can we bring up the composite document that I prepared? so that we can see this change in context. The, the title of the document is Article 12, Malofchik Substitute Motion Amendments.
and Vakil is at the bottom. It's the one in, I don't know how it's gonna show up on the screen, but it should be like a violet. And it's labeled V, as in Vakil. And it's the last one there. This, ad, this would add an item C to the moratorium section of the Malofchik substitute motion. Do we have a point of order? Mr. Loretti, microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. On your slide showing the order of voting, I was a bit confused by what happens when we get to point seven and eight. If the Malovchek um, substitute motion is approved in some form, mm -hmm. and then we go to vote on eight, will eight be substituting seven, or might we end up having two substitute motions? When we, so I'll answer the general question and I'll answer it specifically as it applies to this situation. The general answer is that when we vote on a substitute motion, we're voting to clobber the main motion with that motion. And so we'll do that in sequence in steps seven and eight. So the Malofchik substitute motion, as amended or not, uh, will, when we take a vote on the Malofchik substitute motion, uh, it'll have an opportunity to clobber the main motion of no action. And then when we vote on the Benson stamps substitute motion, it'll have an opportunity, that vote will, will have the opportunity to clobber whatever the main motion is at that time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Okay, so and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna allow some time here just to make sure that everyone's digesting because there's a lot to unpack here and, uh, and not, every, not all the details of these, of these motions were covered during debate. And so I'm not opening debate again but I think the, the point of order that Mr. Loretti had is, is exactly the kind of point of order that I think is in order uh, to clarify what it is that we're voting on and not an opportunity for further debate on the merits of accepting or rejecting any particular motion. Just understanding what is, it, what is the nature of what we're voting on at each step. And so we'll take this a little more slowly than we usually do because of the complexity of all the motions in this article. So this is the Vakil Amendment that we're looking at here that would add this item C under the moratorium section of the Malofchik substitute motion. That's, that's what this next vote is, the Vakil Amendment that would amend the Malofchik substitute motion with this item in the uh, moratorium. And so I'll read it here. The moratorium shall not apply to artificial turf that is considered PFAS or P PFOS free according to REACH and Prop 65 shall be non-detect non for 30 PFAS compounds tested via EPA method 537 modified DOD slash DOE QSM 5.1 or equivalent and have a statement from the vendor that the turf does not contain and is not manufactured with PFAS or PFOA. Such measurement will be done by an independent laboratory not affiliated with the turf manufacturer. Um, and so that's what we're voting on, whether to add this item C to the moratorium section of the Malofchik substitute motion. So let's now go to voting. We'll open voting on the Vakil Amendment. Okay, voting is open. So if you're in favor of amending the Malofchik substitute motion with the Vakil Amendment that adds that item C to the moratorium, vote yes. To leave it unamended, vote no. Okay, let's close voting. And the Vakil Amendment fails. 88 in the affirmative, 135 in the negative, and two abstentions. Now let's go back to the sequence slide. And so next we have the Greenspawn Amendment. Actually, we can just go to the document, that's fine. Uh, so number two in the order is the Greenspawn Amendment, which is colored in green, and it has the label G. And it, the amend, what's being amended is in two parts. First, there's the, uh, uh, the, the introductory paragraph of the vote language, which we see here. Uh, it's adding an exemption based on uh, land, right, land that, that, that's, or properties that are exempt from the moratorium. The Arlington High School, including Pierce Field, was already part, that, that exemption 
for the AHS field, including Pierceville, that's already part of the MOFCHIC substitute motion. And the Greenspawn Amendment would add additionally an exemption for the moratorium for um, Poets Corner Park and any adjacent land that may be acquired by the town um, in the future. And so then we'll scroll down to the bottom and we have essentially the same amended text in the moratorium section that just reiterates what I just described. So in addition to the exemption for Arlington High School, including Pierce Field would be Poets Corner Park, any property there or adjacent to it that is now or in, or in the future and ends up uh, owned by the town. So that is the Greenspawn Amendment. It's seeking to, uh, Mr. Jamison, do you have a point of order? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Gordon Chambers in pre Precinct 12. First, I want to compliment you on your handling of this debate. Uh, my question is, does this include the new fields that are part of the Arlington uh, um, High School rebuild? Will those also be exempted based upon this language? From the, are you asking about the, the part that's in the original Malofchik substitute motion? Yeah, just for context with it, the current amendment of moratorium stuff. I do, I'll ask one of the proponents to be sure, Mr. Weinstein, you're, you're, you're saying yes? It does. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so once again, what we're voting on, let's say we have a point of order here, Mr. Gersh. John Gersh, Precinct 18. Mr. Moderator, are these two thirds or one half votes? These uh, amendments are always majority. Even if they're amending a two thirds vote main motion. And the, the substitutes? The substitutes are also majority. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks for asking. Okay, so the next vote that we'll be taking is the Greenspawn Amendment, which would add an additional exemption to the mor moratorium for the Poets Corner Park land that's owned by the town or adjacent property that might be purchased by the town during the time frame of this moratorium. Okay, so seeing no more points of order or questions about what we're voting on, let's now open voting on the Greenspan, the, the Greenspawn Amendment to the Malofchik Substitute Motion. If you're in favor of amending the Malofchik Substitute Motion with the Greenspawn Amendment to include an additional exemption for the Poets Corner land that's owned by the town, vote yes. If you wish to leave the Malofchik substitute motion unamended, leave the, ex the exempted lands from the moratorium as is, then vote no. Okay, let's close voting. And the Greenspawn Amendment fails. 96 in the affirmative, 129 in the negative, three abstentions. Uh, let's now go back to the document. And next we'll be taking up the Schlickman Amendment. This is highlighted in gray in the composite document. And this reduces the more, more this, the Schlickman Amendment would reduce the moratorium and study committee from two years to one year. So if we scroll through the document for those gray highlighted sections with the tag S for Schlickman. Great. Uh, so this, I believe we're looking at the study committee part. So the Schlickman amendment, just to be clear, it amends both the, the, the duration of the study committee and the moratorium. And so, what we, and you can see those pieces here. So at the top of the screen, it amends the study committee from two years ending in 2025 to instead end in 2024. And in the moratorium, it similarly um, reduces that from ending in, 20, in, in two years to effectively one year, the 2024 annual town meeting. Yes, Mr. Rosenthal. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Mr. Moderator, I may or may not be uh, remembering correctly, but I was under the impression that the Schlickman Amendment, in addition to that, also changed the uh, number of people on the uh, committee. Am I it wrong? It does not, no. Am I incorrect about that? You are incorrect. Thank you. 
point of order, Mr. Weinstein? I'll also point out, and I don't know if you're going to mention this, but go ahead. Uh, Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. I just wanted to clarify that. What's that? Well, l let's hear Mr. Weinstein's point of order. Oh, the point of order was to correct your um, your summary of what was being changed. Okay. The um, the Malofchik, uh the duration the, the the duration was not two years. It was up to two years. It could you, be yep. less. You are correct. You're yep. I stand corrected. Thank you. Um, so. Right, I'm just trying to clarify under what conditions it would be less than two years. Is, is that up to the committee? Is that, yeah, Mr. Weinstein? You're right. The duration of the moratorium is tied directly to the duration of the study committee. So if the study committee were to wrap up in a year, the moratorium would end in a year. That's Got it. the flexibility. Got it. Got it, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, and that was a reasonable point of order. Yep, uh, uh, yep. Ms. LaCourt. I also want to add that there is a side effect of the Slickham Amendment, which would allow the main motion, if, it, if the Slickham Amendment amends, if, it's, if you vote to amend the uh, Malofchik substitute motion with the Schlickman Amendment, and then adopt the, the Malofchik substitute motion as amended by the Schlickman Amendment, then the main motion at that point would be divisible. And I would be inclined at that point to divide the question separately between the study committee question and the moratorium question. Uh, in the absence of the Schlickman Amendment, the Malofchik substitute motion is not divisible because of an independence between the parts that are, uh, and that, that, in, that, that dependent link between the two gets stricken as a side effect of the Schlickman Amendment, just to be clear on how that affects the procedures. Ms. LaCourt? Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for reading my mind. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, a any other points of order? Any questions on what we are voting on? Okay, let's go to a vote. If you're in favor of uh, a vote on the Schlickman Amendment, if you're in favor of reducing the maximum allotted time to the study committee and the moratorium to one year through the Schlickman Amendment, vote yes. If you wanna leave the Malofchik substitute motion as is and allow up to two years for the study committee and the moratorium, then you can vote no to leave it unamended. Okay, voting is open. Okay, let's close voting. The amendment passes. 132 in the affirmative, 96 in the negative, one abstention. Um, now, just one more point on this. Um, and I'm going to belabor this a little bit because there's a lot of complexity here, and that which I want to make clear so everyone knows what they're voting on, what the implications of those votes are. The Malofchik substitute motion, as it stands now, is now amended by the Schlickman Amendment the Malofchik substitute motion itself is not actually divisible because substitute motions are not divisible. If the, because you can't, you can't substitute a part of a substitute motion for the main motion. If the current state of the, slick, or of the uh, Malofchik substitute motion as it's currently amended, if, if it becomes the main motion through substitution, the main motion at that point will be divisible. And it's a minor point, but that's where we're at right now. So now let's look at the Palisade Amendment. This is highlighted in blue in the composite document. And this would grant voting rights to all committee members. So let's now, have we scrolled there? Perfect. And I believe that's the only section that's amended by the Palisade Amendment. And so you can see, you can ignore the orange highlights because that's a different motion that we'll get to. Um, the Palisade Amendment 
would strike the distinction between the voting and non-voting members and just make all the members of the committee voting members without changing the composition of the committee aside from voting rights. It's just changing the voting rights from, uh, let's say, in the, just to be clear, in the Malofchik substitute motion, there are uh, three non-voting members, the director of public health or its designee, the director of recreation or its designee, and superintendent of schools or its designee. Oh, you can see my highlights, great. Um, so these, these members here, under the Malofchik substitute motion as it currently stands, are not voting members. Through the Palisadi amendments, they would become voting members, along with all the other members that are already listed there. Any points of order, any questions on what we're voting on? Again, this is not opening debate, just clarity on what is the nature of what you're all vo voting on. Yep. yep, go ahead, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I only see five. Uh, so I'm just trying to see who's stricken. Oh, that's a different one. But right now. Oh, so the, okay. What's probably not clear, what I'm highlighting here, if you scroll down a little bit, there's uh, this orange highlighted section, D1. That's the Dennis Amendment 1, which we haven't gotten to yet, voting wise. Um, that section is not added by the Dennis 1 Amendment. It's amended by the Dennis 1 Amendment. So the portion of that, that it, as it stands in the Malofchik substitute motion is this. So there's one member there already as the Malofchik substitute motion currently stands. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's two. There's two, that's right, sorry, there are two. Um, and so if you go up, that's three. All right, it, this part is stricken. Yeah, the that's stricken part is, yeah. I don't have a version of this that doesn't show the future motions, unfortunately. So that's in D1. That's there's D1, two here. correct, Mr. Moderator? There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Doesn't it say seven on the top, though? Uh, that's that... from a different amendment. Okay, thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Moderator. I, I apologize. Sorry for, for... sorry for my confusion. No, no, it, it is confusing. Um, any other questions on the voting membership? Okay, seeing none. Um, so let me describe it first, and then and then we'll open vote. We'll, we'll we'll go to voting. Um, if you're in favor of making all eight members of the committee voting members, including the three highlighted here, if we scroll up just a little bit, if you're in favor of making these three members of the committee voting members, you would vote yes to adopt the Palisadi amendment. If you wish to keep those members as non-voting as it stands in the current Malofchik substitute motion, then you would vote no. Okay, so let, let's open voting now on the Palisadi Amendment. And I see a number of people entering, entering the speaking queue, so you have not voted yet. Okay, vote, uh, voting is now open. And please confirm on your handsets that your vote uh, has registered. And in this case, if you press one, one or two again, that will not that, that will not delete your vote. It won't toggle your vote. It'll just confirm your vote. So you're safe to press whatever button you want to press for voting. You're safe to press it again until that number hits zero, like it just did. Okay, let's close voting. Okay, and the Palisadi amendment passes. One forty-seven in the affirmative, eighty in the negative, one abstention. So the um, uh, the Malofchik substitute motion is now amended by both the uh, Green, uh, sorry, the, the Schlickman Amendment and the Palisadi Amendment. Um, maybe if I'm really quick here, I could actually update this while, um, that'd be kind of hard though. Um, let's go back to the composite doc. <clears throat> so just to confirm here, the, why don't I update this now so we don't have more confusion. Um, the Vakil Amendment failed, so I will actually just strike that from the document, so it's not going to show up anymore. The Greenspawn Amendment, um, did that fail? Yeah, they both failed, thank you. So Greenspawn, I will delete from the document, so it's not distracting us. Uh, 
apologies for doing this real time. I didn't have the time to work out all 66 possible combinations ahead of time. Um, let's see. And Palisati passed. So. Yeah. So Palisati now. But it struck that. And then I'll just inline these changes here so it's more clear. Okay, I think that, and then also Schlickman, Schlick, Schlickman passed, so I'll just add that. All right, that's probably good enough for now. And, okay, so now we are at Dennis Amendment 1. This is the orange one. This would change the number of members from 8 to 7. And, yeah, and let's see. And this appears in three places. Yep. The first place is just changing the number eight to the number seven. The second place is it's amending this section A24 here by changing it from two residents um, who have shown, who've demonstrated experience working with local envi environmental advocacy or nonprofit organizations to be appointed by the town moderator, changing it from that in the initial uh, Milovchik substitute motion to one res, from two to one resident, neutral on the issue of artificial turf to serve as the chair of the committee and to be appointed by the town moderator. So it's changing two of those appointees to one and that one appointee under the Dennis, one amend the Dennis Amendment one would be the chair of the committee. And then we go down to the third, or the, the third section that's amended here, an organization of the first meeting, and this is just clarifying, this is changing now, it's a side effect of the previous change, that the Milovchik substitute motion initially called for the first meeting to take a vote on the chair of the committee going forward, and with the, the change in the Dennis Amendment 1, is that the chair was already selected via appointment by the moderator. And so the chair is not voted by the committee in the case of Dennis Amendment 1. Do we have any questions about that? Okay. So let's open voting now on whether to amend the Malofchik substitute motion as amended by Schlickman and Palisati amendments we're voting on whether to further amend the Milovchik substitute motion by Dennis Amendment 1 that decreases the membership from 8 to 7 and makes the moderator single appointment instead of two, the single appointment, the chair of the committee, rather than the Milovchik substitute motion which specifies that the chair would be elected at the first meeting of the committee. Okay, so let's open voting now for Dennis Amendment 1 that makes that change to the composition and the chair status of the meeting. So if you're in favor of the Dennis Amendment 1, vote yes. If you want to leave the Malofchik substitute motion as is, as it's already been previously amended but no further at this point, then you can vote 2 for no. Okay, let's close voting. And the Dennis Amendment 1 passes. 118 in the affirmative, 104 in the negative, three abstentions. Okay, so let's now go back to the document. And, let's see. and we are now taking up Dennis Amendment 2. This is the last of the amendments to the Malofchik substitute motion. And let's, it's, and I believe it's, it's amending just this one section here by, by adding this entire sub, uh, this, this item. Yeah, that's the only change it makes. I'll just read the whole thing. Uh, it says it's under committee charge and reporting uh, for the uh, study committee. 
it would add to the charge. The study committee's investigation shall include best practices of site-specific design, procurement, and stewardship of turf drawn from the experiences of other municipalities. These practices shall include, but not be limited to, the certification and testing of turf components, maintenance plans that extend the turf's useful life, the choice of turf infill, down cycling options for the turf at end of life, recovery and reuse of infill, stormwater drainage with filtration and testing, mitigation of infill migration, and pre-development soil and groundwater analysis reference points. So a vote in favor of Dennis Amendment 2 would add this item here to the study committee's charge. If you wish to not add that to the Malofchik substitute motion as previously amended, uh, then you would vote no. Did we have a point of order here? Okay, yeah, come on up. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Mr. Moderator, I just have a question regarding the Dennis Two Amendment. Yeah. Um, does that mean this is only speaking to artificial turf, or are you talking about both artificial and natural? Let's see. It does say uh, design, procurement, and stewardship of turf drawn from the experiences of other municipalities. Now, I, I, I didn't answer your question. I just read the text, and I only, I only understand it as far as the text. Uh, I can't speak to what the intention of that was. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Heim, would you care to offer an interpretation? Doug Heim, Town Council. I don't want to speak, I want to be somewhat careful here and speak for the folks who offered this amendment, but my understanding of it is that it's trying to offer a more comprehensive study that includes uh, a broader range of solutions and products so it's not just one type of artificial, well, the type of artificial turf that we've really been talking about, but what are the sort of more cost-benefit analysis of that, alternatives, et cetera. I think that's probably consistent with the alternatives analysis we engage in in some other settings. Mr. Moderator, I'm just conscious of the fact that I'm not the proponent of the amendment, but that's how I read it. So yeah. you're reading as if it's artificial turf, different kinds of artificial turf, and we're not talking about possible. Well, I, I want to be, just, sorry. I don't understand it because I didn't write it. I, Doug Heim, Town Council. Again, Mr. Moderator, I don't want to speak for the proponents of this amendment, um, but my interpretation of it is, is that there's probably a wider range of products out there, including products with natural turf that sometimes have a subsurface layer underneath them. Okay. So I, I would assume that this is charging the committee with studying a pretty broad, broad range of products, including what might be considered natural turf, but isn't like a, you know, just a naturally growing grass field. I, I'd like some confirmation that that's within the, what they contemplated, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, I guess the question is, because uh, I don't want to reopen debate necessarily, but also I'm wondering if uh, if it's relevant what the intentions of the proponent are because we're voting on the text. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Mr. Hyde? So, uh, I would interpret it as broadening the scale. So the words uh, site-specific design, procurement, stewardship of turf drawn from experience of other municipalities would lead me to believe that what this amendment is contemplating, is, for example, since we've been talking about like Poets Corner, you've got a grass turf over an uncapped landfill, mm -hmm. and I think it's asking to uh, look at what the best practice is for including natural turf, um, and understanding that the definition of national turf might be a little bit uh, fluid, um, over those types of surfaces. Because um, it says, for example, certification of testing of turf components, that's probably, in my interpretation, relative to more artificial turf, but at the same time, you're talking about um, infill downcycling options, again, 
probably artificial turf, uh, recovery and reuse of infill stormwater drainage. There are certain things that um, sometimes are underneath a natural turf field that are meant to help drain it. Um, and then pre-development soil and groundwater analysis is kind of independent of whether it's artificial turf or natural turf. So, so some components are applicable to one type of turf versus another or both potentially. Right. Yeah, and I mean the way that it's the way that it's written. Um, again, when you're talking about site specific, I, I think you're trying to examine what the conditions are, you know, for some of the fields that we've been talking about, and then you know what the practice are f is for the different pieces of turf that isn't usually just grass seed necessarily. So I, I guess I, I do think that this is primarily talking about artificial turf the way that most of us are talking about it. I just want to be clear that there are options to my understanding that sort of involve some hybrid technologies. I don't know that it's just talking about grass seed, but I don't think that that's the way most of these fields are constructed in modern uh, parlance. Thank, Thank you. you. We had a point of order from back there. Yes. Arthur Prokosh, Precinct 4. Mr. Moderator, uh, I'd like to know if town council could comment on whether we're looking at uh, article or subsection A1, AI1B here, or, or subsection AI1 directly above it, uh, whether that uh, larger article would uh. govern that larger article, says the study committee shall investigate artificial turf. Right, so like the question is, does, does the turf, does the unspecified turf in this sub item, is that really scoped to artificial turf from this more granular item, or the, this, this coarse grained item? Um, Mr. Hine? Doug Hine, Town Council. But Obviously, there, but there's also, I'm sorry, just if I can interrupt, as well as available natural alternatives to its use. So. Uh, uh, Mr. Heim? Yeah. Doug Heim, Town Council. Again, I think we're obviously talking primar primarily about artificial turf, but within the context of the amendment as it's written, we're clearly opening up the scope a little bit to consider what alternatives are available, how these things are composed. I, I think that the best way to read it is that it's broadening the charge. So it could certainly include certain types of uh, quote unquote natural turf, but it, it, it's, it's, it's clearly meant to expand it beyond, I think, what we've just been talking about in terms of the quote unquote plastic fields. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weinstein? Jordan Weinstein, uh, Precinct 21. First of all, I, I don't understand why Dennis is not up here to explain what he meant. But, but my point of order is, well, we're talking about the definition of what we're voting on, so we have to know what we're voting on. In reading the literature, uh, the industry literature about artificial turf, tur wait, 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 hold on, everyone. Let's, I, I have not called scope. I'm, tur I'm about to, but go ahead. Tur <laughs> turf is defined, is used, it, to, to express artificial turf. That's what it means. Okay. So, how, is that not, how is that a point of order? Okay, so that's a point of information, which as we've already covered, is not in this book, but um, Mr. Slickman. And, and the reason, just to answer the question, the reason why I'm at, not calling uh, Dr. Dennis, the opponent up here, is that we're now, we're now at the stage of interpreting the text. And so someone, whoever's enforcing this or, care, or executing this, like the study committee, they may or may not ask the proponent of this. That they might just be going from, we have to go from the charge. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, point of order, uh, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Because we can't staple Mr. Dennis to the copies of the resolution as it moves forward, uh, we're stuck with this language, whatever it is. So whatever it is and however you want to interpret it, I think, it, it, am I not right, that that is what we're voting, this language, and nothing in this discussion or all these points of order will change this language. Thank you for the point of information. That was not a point of order, Mr. James. We have actually went, there's a hand back that's been up back there. 
what could possibly happen designing something by a committee of 252 people? <laughs> Jennifer Lukowski, Precinct 3. Mr. Moderator, is there anything in the text that is preventing the study committee from studying these issues without the Dennis Amendment? I, do we need the Dennis Amendment in order to address these questions? I, I think that I think the question is borderline, but I, I will allow it uh, since uh, there's clearly uh, some confusion about the, like how to interpret uh, this amendment in the context of the substitute motion that it's amending. Um, so, the study committee shall investigate her in regards to decision. I mean, I don't see any text in here. Mr. Heim, feel free to chime in. I don't see any text in here that would prohibit the study committee from venturing into that territory. Doug Heim, Town Council. So yeah. I think it's pretty clear that the, that the overall language here is meant to aim this at artificial turf and its relative safety. In the committee charge section AV, AI1, it says it shall investigate artificial turf in regards to its safety, environmental effect, and cost effectiveness, as well as the available natural alternatives to its use. So generally speaking, I think that the alternatives are within, at least contemplated, for the study committee. I do think that the amendment is asking to more, uh, is asking to focus uh, almost as much on those alternatives as uh, the artificial turf. Yeah. But I would say that it's within scope for them to consider, hey, what are the alternatives here? Um, I don't know that it's asking to engage in quite the same sort of cost-benefit analysis. And Thank Mr. Heim, if you could step, did you add more? Or? Uh, yes, I, I did want to clarify. My apologies for not being clear. I wasn't concerned about the, is natural turf included so much as do we need this amendment to include consider best practices. Okay, so I can answer, I, I think I can answer that. So, and Mr. Heim, you might want to get ready uh, at a podium. The word shall, I believe that, my understanding is that I'm not a lawyer, uh, but best practices are that the preferred verb here is must, but shall is usually used as, uh, you know, uh, as a synonym for that, even though it, it, it's a little bit watered down. But my interpretation of this, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Heim, would be, that this is effective, that word shall is effective, requiring the study committee with the Dennis Amendment to, to look at these things. And in the absence of this amendment, the study committee would just not, not be required to look at these things. Is that your understanding? Doug Heim, Town Council, correct. So if you look at the Dennis Amendment 2, it's essentially including what's sort of mandated, not necessarily optioned, to include uh, best practice and also site-specific design would be the other major um, component, as well as some specific uh, uh, other elements that while I presume a committee would probably want to look at if it's just looking at artificial turf, um, would, uh, it is sort of directed within this scope of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so just to be clear, my understanding is that I think our uh, joint understanding is that Dennis Amendment 2 would add these requirements to the study committee and so if you're in favor of adding these requirements to the committee's charge, you would vote yes on this amendment. If you don't want to add those requirements, um, that the study committee could optionally look into these things if they wish to, perhaps, uh, then you would vote no. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have another hand, Mr. Rosenthal? Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Uh, Mr. Moderator, there is a... Excuse me. There is a term used in this amendment uh, or substitute motion that I've never encountered before, and uh, that term is downcycling. I, know, I think I know what recycling is. I do not know what downcycling is. Um, is there some way to get clarification on what is meant by that, or do we just have to vote on this uh, without knowing, without a clear definition of that? Um, yeah, we, we can get clarification on that. Um, I'm not familiar with what downcycling is. Uh, 
Any, anyone up front wish to raise their hands to explain what downcycling is? Uh, is Mr. Slotnick here? So we're looking for the definition of the word downcycle. Okay, Larry Slotnick, uh, Precinct 7, uh, co-chair of Zero Waste Arlington. So most of us think that when we put items into our blue bin, they're going to be recycled. The fact is that most of those materials are downcycled, meaning they're not made into a similar, an item that's similar to what you put in that because the processes don't, uh, don't enable that to happen. So when it comes to things like plastics, fibrous materials such as paper and cardboard, textiles, those things will all be made into a lower grade of those items, whether it's textile, fiber, or plastic. They will not be made into the exact same kind of container that you put into your blue bin. So should I speak to uh, the turf application? Of, of that or not? No, I, I, th I think that covers it. I mean, I think the, the concept I think is clear that it's I, it, it's not a recycling where you, you can just keep reproducing the same type of product, but correct. you produce a product that doesn't require the structural integrity or whatever of the original material. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other points of order about the meaning of what we're voting on? Yep. Yeah. Ms. Friedman? Bethann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, I don't quite understand how you can evaluate a site-specific design because it doesn't anywhere say what the site is. Well, I think that'd be the sites that are being considered for installation of turf. Um, okay, do we have any other questions about the uh, Dennis Amendment 2? Okay, so let's let's go to voting. So just uh, to, as a reminder, if you wanted that section that we've been studying for the last several minutes, if you want that added to the Milovchik substitute motion, you can vote yes for the, can, can we scroll up a little bit? Uh, the other way, sorry, I meant down. Yeah, there we go. Um, if you wanna add this yellow highlighted section to the Milovchik substitute motion to include include this requirement uh, on the study committee's charge, then you would vote yes to amend the, the Milovchik substitute motion with this new text. If you wish to not add it to the Milovchik substitute motion, you would vote no. So let's now open voting on the Dennis Amendment 2. Okay, voting is open. Vote yes to amend the Milovchik substitute motion with Dennis Amendment 2. Vote no to not further amend the Milovchik substitute motion and leave it as is. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes. 126 in the affirmative, 95 in the negative, three abstentions. The Milovchik substitute motion is now amended by the Schlickman Amendment, the, Pal the uh, Palisade Amendment, um, both Dennis Amendments, the amend okay, and both Dennis Amendments. And so now that brings us to the Milovchik substitute motion as amended. So let me quickly... I should have left the, I only do this. If I want to make a point of order, can I do that? What's that? Uh, yeah, do we have a point of order? Yeah, I had a point of order, but I unfortunately I, put I, it on. I'm sorry, na na name and precinct, please. I'm yeah, Mozina, precinct, four, uh, whatever, 15, prior and yeah. 11. Now yeah. I know how to make a point of order. Okay. Point of order. Yes. How to make a point of order for. Uh, you state your point of order. Stop. 
I know how to do it. I was on the speaker queue by mistake. Point of order. Uh, what, what is your point of order, Ms. Bazzini? She doesn't have a point of order. She is um, over with her clarification and confusion. Oh, okay. Thank you. Point of order, no, no, no confusion. Okay, uh, we have a point of order back there? Yep. I see a hand raised in the back. No, yeah. uh, either of you. Uh, Hi, Josh Lobel, Precinct 8. Uh, just a quick question on the divisible comment you made. Do you, is the um, Stamps Benson substitute motion not divisible because it's not amended? Is that what you're suggesting? We haven't gotten to that yet, but uh, these, the, so again, like, this is a technical point, but substitute motions per se are not divisible. Mm -hmm. They're not susceptible of division um, because you can't adopt a portion, uh, like a part of a substitute motion independent of the other parts. But once a substitute motion is voted, if it's voted in the affirmative, it then clobbers the main motion. And at that point, it, it, it may be divisible. And the okay. Benson Stamps Amendment, if that becomes the main motion, it will be divisible. The Malofchik substitute motion as amended by, the, you know, as amended, uh, is divisible. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, so actually, let me quickly, why don't we do uh, another point of order here? Beth Elliott, Precinct 10. I just wanted to clarify the purpose of, like, so if we vote yes to substitute the motion, that just makes it the motion that we can then vote yes or no. It'll make, it'll, it'll take the Malofchik substitute motion as amended, and it'll make it the main motion. Okay, and then we would have to vote again on, once it's the main motion. At Sorry, least, new at, town meeting member at, here, so. Oh, no, sir, this is probably the most confusing one I've ever seen. Um, the... There'll be at least two more votes. votes. One would be, why don't we bring up that slide and I, could, I, could, I can show where we are in, in the flow. Sorry, everyone. No, no worries. Yeah, this one here. So we are currently sitting right before vote number seven. Okay. We've run through the first six votes and we have a Malofchik substitute motion that's now been amended and we're about to vote on the Malofchik substitute motion. Um, and if we do division, this weird thing, division, which we don't ordinarily do, that would be at the very end. So we don't have to worry about that yet. We're already in a, we're already in a scenario where the Malofchik substitute motion, uh, as amended, if it becomes the main motion, will eventually be divisible. But that'll be the, the very last step of all of okay. this. So if we vote, if it gets a yes now, then it becomes the main motion and other things happen. If we vote no then we, now, yeah. then we go to Benson Stamps. We're gonna go to Benson Stamps next regardless. Oh dear God, okay. <laughs> point of order. Uh, uh, we're in the middle of a point of order right now, so. Did you have anything further in your point? I guess I'll let you know. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll make it clear. I mean, I don't need to run through everything. Uh, I'll go through each step, what we're doing at that point. Was there a point of order somewhere that I heard? In the, in the back, yep. Yes. Uh, oh, we have it from the satellite room? Okay. <laughs> uh, Beth is a new. There we go. Okay. Do we have a point of order from the satellite room? Pass. Uh, okay, point of order in the room here. Hi, Ian Goodsell, uh, Precinct 11. Could you, so I've, I've never seen a, a divided vote before. Could you explain why that would be div divided? And like, if, would you have to make, would someone have to make a motion to divide it? Uh, so, so I have to explain this before, I'll explain it very briefly Thank you. here, which is that uh, ordinarily, a motion can be made from the floor, like an, like an amendment and so on. Uh, a motion can be made to divide a question if the parts are independent of each other. Um, because in this case, because this, uh, this article, the motions under it are so complex, 
debate happened all at once, and now that we're going through voting, there's no longer any opportunity for debate. And what we're doing right now is not debate and just taking a series of points okay. of order because there's a lot of confusion because it's very complicated. Understood. And so uh, as moderator, I have the discretion to divide questions without a motion. And I intend to do it in this case mm -hmm. because the meeting won't have the opportunity at that point to offer such a motion because it's just going to be a sequence of votes with no intervening debate. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't understand. I didn't yep. get that right at the time. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Ms. Stamps. Uh, Ms. Uh, Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Uh, Mr. Moderator, do I understand correctly that procedurally we're going to vote on the Malachic substitute motion as amended as to whether we want to make it the main motion? And if it passes and it's now the main motion, then we're going to vote on the Benson Stamps substitute motion to see if that's going to become the main motion that's right. instead of the lock. only that's right. Only one so, substitute motion can be can clobber the main motion at a time. We're basically right. taking okay. the whole decision tree, and the reason why this exercise is so complicated is that we have to take that decision tree, okay. and we have to break it into a linear sequence of binary choices. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Vote for Benson Stamps. Oh no! No. Uh, that is stricken from the record, and that was not called for. Um, Ms. Stamps, you know better than that. Okay, so we're now looking at the, uh, any other questions? Okay, so before we go, and let me just quickly, why don't we, we're almost at 9.30. Hold on. Well, here's the thing. I know, I know everyone wants to vote at this point, but if we take the break now, it'll give me an opportunity to update the document unless everyone's very clear on what we're doing. I, I, I don't know how to interpret any of that. Um, okay. well, hold on, hold, hold on. Hold on. Okay. So, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do this right now then. But I'm going to update you. But the compromise is you're going to wait for me to edit the doc real time, and it's going to be very painful for all of you. Um, and I'm going to take my time. Okay. So if, if you want to bring up the doc, so we can show this, so you can make, so it's painful for everybody, not just me. Um, let's see. So the green spawn amendment failed, correct? So I will just remove that. I did, but then I reverted it because I wanted to show what was actually amended, and I didn't think of that. Uh, yep, and the keel I already struck, Schlickman, Palisade. So Schlickman, Palisade, Dennis one and Dennis two, those all passed, correct? Yeah. Madam Clerk? Yes. So, okay, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And so now we'll slowly go through section by section so we know what you're all voting on with the, um, with the, the Malofchik substitute motion as amended. Okay. So nothing in the introductory paragraph. And we have a point of order? Where's that? Was the Schlickman um, amendment in the in the uh, moratorium section stricken? I mean, did you did you? Oh, I, I I restored this document to the way it was oh. earlier, and so I just I removed. Uh, I just yeah, this actually didn't take me very long. I overstated it. I was bluffing, and you caught me on it. But um, <laughs> the only ones that I removed were the. Um, that I struck from this document were the amendments that failed. I just, I just deleted those portions of the text from this document. I haven't seen, I haven't seen the uh, moratorium section of this document. Okay, so we'll, we'll scroll through it section by section so everyone's clear on what's been amended here, okay? Sorry, Elaine Crowder, Precinct okay. 19. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's see. Can we, is that the whole text? Uh, it's close enough, right? And so, 
Uh, so the changes here, the, the, um, the amendments that, that have been applied to the Milofsic substitute motion are, there's now seven members. They're all voting members. Okay, we can scroll down. And instead of two residents uh, appointed by the moderator, it's one. And that one, and if we continue scrolling, an, a resident who is neutral uh, on artificial turf. Um, and that one appointed, that one member appointed by the moderator uh, shall be the chair of the committee. So the committee will not choose its own chair. I will choose the chair as moderator. And scrolling down, we have this new requirement in the charge of the study committee to in, uh, investigate best practices and so on uh, related to various types of turf. And scrolling on, and the study committee uh, will continue for one year until the 2024, until the, yeah, uh, the dissolution of the 2024 annual town meeting. And the moratorium as well uh, will run until the dissolution of the 2024 annual town meeting, provided that subsequent. Uh, yes. And that's it. So that is the Malofchik substitute motion as amended. Okay, seeing no points of order, let's go to a vote on the Malofchik substitute motion as amended. Point of information. Point of information. Uh, it's ex extremely quick. Is it a question it, or? Yes. Okay, it, it's a question. Okay, it, point is, of order. Is, is the Benson stamps substitute motion going to be amended in the same ways? No. Okay, because I there, can't. There, there are no amendments on that. Okay, I can't vote without knowing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, voting is now open on the Malofchik substitute motion as amended as we just ran through. If you're in favor of the Malofchik substitute motion as amended, vote yes. If you want to leave the main motion as no action, vote no. The main motion is currently no action. We're voting here whether to replace it with the Malofchik substitute motion. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails. Very close. 110 in the affirmative, 116 in the negative, one abstention. The motion fails. The main motion is still no action. And now we have the Benson Stamps substitute motion. And so the next choice, the next vote that will be before us is whether or not to replace the main motion of no action with the Benson Stamps substitute motion. Uh, so let's now bring that up on screen. And so it's difficult to compare this directly to what we just went through looking at the items of uh, the, the Milosevic substitute motion, which is why it wasn't articulated as a series of amendments. We actually tried that. It was not feasible. And so it really had to be its own standalone substitute motion. Um, so, yeah, let's, uh, so there's very similar elements to this. Uh, let's see, that there's seven voting members uh, and two ex officio non-voting members. And none of this is up for amendment. This is just the substitute motion as is. Um, let's see. Yeah, and the first, I guess, uh, can you scroll back up a little bit? Because this is something that was amended in the Milovchik substitute motion about, I can stop there. Uh, item D, the organization at, and first meeting. Um, it would be convened by the Director of Health and Human Services or the designee. And the first order of business should be the self-organization committee through the election of one or more chairs. So the committee will choose its own chairs, um, like among the voting members. Um, the committee charge and reporting is these two items, A and B, under item two. 
review and report on artificial turf, its health, safety, and environmental impacts, and potential mitigation measures in comparison of artificial turf to natural turf fields. Study committee shall complete, so it'll be required to complete its work and report its findings to town meeting and the select board no later than 30 days prior to the 2024 annual town meeting or, any, or to any earlier special town meeting if the report is ready earlier. Um, the committee will be dissolved uh, concurrent with the dissolution of the 2024 annual town meeting unless there's a vote of that in the town meeting to, uh, uh, to dissolve it uh, uh, earlier or to extend the committee. And then the moratorium on the construction or, inst or installation of artificial, artificial turf on town property will take pl pl place immediately if, if it actually gets passed as the main motion um, and will remain in effect until the solution of the 2024 annual time. So we believe all the elements basically expire uh, at or adjacent to the 2024 uh, annual town meeting. Um, unless there's a vote of time meeting to effectuate an earlier or, uh, or later uh, moratorium with a future vote. But the default would be uh, dissolution of, uh, or the, 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 the end of the moratorium and the study committee by default would be at or around next year's annual town meeting. So one year. Um, and similarly to the Malofchik substitute motion, there's an exemption uh, for the Arlington High School grounds, including Pierce Field, uh, where the moratorium would not apply to those, uh, to those fields. So that's similar as the previous substitute motion. Do we have any points of order on the Benson Stamps substitute motion? Okay, seeing none, let's go now to, so if you're, right now we have a main motion of, oh, we, we do, okay. And this had better not be any advocacy for, okay. Ms. Stamps? And so the main motion is still no action. And the next vote will be on whether to substitute the Benson Stamp substitute motion in place. Ms. Stamps? Susan, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. And I do apologize to the meeting for my little outburst there a few minutes ago. Um, just a point of order. I think there was one element that, Mr. Moderator, when you were going through that you didn't mention that might be important to the meeting, which is the conflict of interest rules for the committee. I did not. Let's, let's scroll up to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. Where? Does, it say, does, it, does it actually say... It doesn't say, con I didn't see the word conflict in here. Does it say something else? Oh, okay. Got it. No, no voting member shall have testified within the past five years in a court or administrative hearing in favor of or against the use of artificial turf shall have worked for or in a firm or organization that would, within the last five years, past five years, has been, has had any involvement with the selection, installation, or management of the construction of an artificial turf field or whose income in the past five years was derived in whole or in part from work with artificial turf fields or shall be a current or former member of the American Sports Builders Association or the Synthetic Turf Council or whose business or firm or principal is or has been a member. Uh, I believe I asked uh, Mr. Heim at one point whether there was any issue in enumerating these and I believe there were no legal issues with this enumeration of uh, requirements. He, he says correct. Okay. Any other any other points of order? Okay. Seeing none, we'll now take a vote on whether to a vote of yes would be to replace the main motion of no action, replace that with the Benson Stamps substitute motion. That is the vote. So let's bring up voting. Voting is now open. So if you wish to make the Benson Stamp substitute motion, turn it into the main motion, vote yes now. If you want the main motion to remain no action, vote no. OK, 
Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes. 117 in the affirmative, 110 in the negative, and one abstention. So now if we can go, if we can go back to the, the, uh, the slide of the vote order. Okay, if you reload the slide, please. Okay. The main motion is now Benson Stamps. Okay, and yeah, there we go. So we just did vote number eight. We'll now, I, I now declare that the study committee part and the moratorium part of the main motion is now divided in the interest of the meeting since the meeting has no opportunity to do that through a motion from the floor. And so the, so we'll now, the next two votes that we take, which will be the last votes, will be votes nine and 10. Once those two parts are voted, the article is disposed of. There's no vote after we finish all of the parts. Uh, Mr. Jameson, do you have a point of order? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I thought you said because something couldn't be amended that it couldn't be div divided. Did I mishear that? No, a substitute motion cannot be divided. Oh, now that it's the main motion, it it's can. The main, we don't have any substitute motions anymore. We just have a main motion with two parts that are independent. Okay, and, and, and now that we're gonna vote on each part, and it's up or down on each part. That's right. And if we vote them down, do we then substitute a no action? If, I, I don't understand the question. So let's say you, we, we vote down the committee part of the main motion. Don't we have to then vote a no action? Yes. Why is that? Because we voted it down. We didn't have any, we didn't pass anything. We but have there's to still pass, the, we still have the, to pass something. There's still the moratorium part. Well, if we, if we, no. <laughs> okay, and if we vote down the moratorium, don't we have to then have a vote of no action? No, because the parts are the parts are voted down at that point. Um, it's just like voting no on an article. Historically, I think we've always ended up voting no action, but yeah, no, no we, we don't have a no action vote anymore. No action is in the past. Do we have another point of order somewhere? Ms. Bergman? Hi, Robin Bergman, Precinct 12. I have a question which is why we wouldn't be putting whether to divide to a vote rather than just going to divide. Shouldn't would the body decide whether to divide the motion? The, all right, so let's go to the book. Division of the question is page 113. Okay. okay. Although Jefferson and Cushing, I don't know who they are, suggest that division of the question can only be done by a vote of the meeting, Bolton suggests that the moderator should divide the question without waiting for a motion if division will serve some constructive or valuable purpose. This is the better rule. So the book is recommending that the better rule um, is that the moderator should divide the question if the moderator feels that there's some constructive or valuable purpose, which I've already stated that there is uh, because the meeting doesn't have an opportunity, there's no speaking cue right now to make a motion from the floor. Um, it does not state that the moderator should bring a vote of division to the meeting. It says that the moderator should divide the question, and that's what I'm that, that's what i intending to do. That's actually what I did. Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, do we have a point of order? Yes, Mr. Moderator, John Marr, precinct yes. four. Yes, Mr. Marr. You've, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, you've just voted to substitute uh, the Bentham Stamps uh, substitute motion, but 
It becomes the main motion. You still have to vote the main motion, do you not? That's what we already voted so, uh, to substitute Benson Stamps as the main motion. That is the main motion now. But yes, but you still have to vote the main motion. That's right. And I've, I've already declared that it is, uh, it is split into part, is divided into parts. But in the past, once it's substituted, it becomes the main motion. It is the main motion. But it's the you main still have in, to vote the main motion. It's the motion. main motion in two parts. Mr. Weinstein, you have a point of order? Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. You stated that the, uh, the body doesn't have a, an opportunity to divide the, um, what's now the main motion, but the body had an opportunity as soon as the Benson uh, stamps motion was submitted to submit a motion to divide. But we didn't have a speaker queue to recognize speakers to make a motion. I'm saying that in the, in the, bef, there was a chance to submit a motion to divide, which exists. But we didn't have a main motion until about a, a few minutes ago that was divisible. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Yep. That, that, that's, that's the crux of the problem. That it's, it was only late in voting that we would know for sure whether we have a, a main motion that's divisible. Mr. Loretti, point of order? I divided it to save a meeting time, but it seems to not be working. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I don't understand the words, if divided, next to 10. If you have divided this motion into two parts, aren't they both um, voted independently, and either one of them or both could be adopted irrespective of what, of what happens with the other one? Right. Can we, can we reload the slide? Uh, there we go. It's fixed. There's no if anymore. Thank you, Mr. Water. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Roster? Adam Oster, Precinct 20. My point of order is that at this point, I think all this discussion ha is out of order. I think we, we've had the education. We know what we're voting on. If it's a little tricky, we'll see when we vote on it the way that you described, and I think we should just vote. Right. I declare that the, uh, I, I think we're clear here. I, I, because of the complexity of this, I want to be extra careful. I know it's very time consuming. I want to be extra careful that everyone knows what we're voting on and why. I'll take one more point of order, and then we're going to move on with voting on the first part. Uh, 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 Mr. Warden actually had his hand up as well, so two, okay. Yeah. Can I go? Go ahead. Very simply, Steve Moore, Precinct 18, this is a two-thirds vote. No, it's a majority, majority vote. vote. Yep, the part, each part is a majority vote. Mr. Warden? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, I, um, I, I don't know about this business, business of dividing it, but whenever we get to it, uh, divided or otherwise, uh, the custom in our, in our meeting has always been, as far as I recall, uh, that once that's done, then we have to vote on the motion as substituted taking another, another vote on the whole thing. Okay. It's kind of a, it's kind of a formality, but it's, my recollection is that's what we've always done. You can ask Mr. So, Leone to confirm that. Right. Thank so, you. So Mr. Warden has standing here as a former occupant of this chair. And so let me just find the citation. This is still under section 49 of town meeting time, division of the question. Okay. This will just take a second. Here, here we go. When all the parts have been acted upon, no further vote on the whole is necessary. Okay. Okay, so we're now going to move on to a vote on the first part of the divided question, which is the study committee. And so this is the study committee from what was the Benson Stamps substitute motion, which is now the main motion. So if we want to bring that up, well, actually, we've just covered this, but the this, this is the study commission, the study committee part of what was the Benson Stamps substitute motion. That is what we're voting on next. If you're in favor of the study committee, you would vote yes. If you're voting against the study committee, vote no. 
Oh, can we see, can we just show that briefly one last time? Oh, yeah, point of order. Can you show that? Yeah, we'll we'll show that right now. Thank you. Um, I think that is Benson stamps. Yes. So the study committee part is what we're voting on here. And yeah, all of this until we see the heading of moratorium. Uh, is that Mr. Leone back there? Yes. O only former moderators have the right to speak <laughs> points of order at this point. Okay. In the very first, uh, John Leone, Precinct 8. Um, in the very first paragraph under the word voted, it mentions moratorium. Is that sentence also oh. stricken in your Thank you. Thank you for moderate, that. modified vote? Thank you for that clarification. Let's look at the first paragraph. It's a very astute eye, thank you. Uh, above that, it's an introductory paragraph. Yes. Um, I apologize that I did not prepare this in advance. I could have uh, there, and you can't see my highlighting here, but uh, are you able to highlight from there on the presentation computer? Um, let's see. It's the, let's see. Are there two, I believe, I believe there's two sentences here. Yep, so the first part that we're voting on is the first sentence of that introductory voted paragraph and part A, artificial turf study committee. The second vote will be the second sentence of the introductory paragraph and part B, moratorium. All right, thank you for that clarification. So the parts are not contiguous, but semantically they are still independent. Point of order? The point of order? Uh, this, yeah. yeah. The, 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 I, I, think, I think we're clear at this point. Um, uh, the third sentence of the introduction. I, I, don't, I don't recognize further speakers because I don't believe there's any former moderators that we haven't exhausted yet. Right. Excuse me? Okay. Point of order, please? No, I'm not recognizing any more points of order because this could, this could go on all night and I don't think it's constructive. Just look at the third paragraph of the introductory, last sentence of the introductory no, paragraph. No, I, I don't recognize the speaker at this point. We're going to move to voting. Thank you. We're going to bring up a vote on the first part, which is the study committee part, which is the first sentence of the introductory paragraph and then part A, Artificial Turf Study Committee. And this will be vote, vote number nine or 10, uh, nine of 10. No, I think, is the green light on? I, don't, I can't see. Okay, then, then no. I, they might be working on dividing the slides. Is that right? Five seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Okay, voting is now open. No, that's not it. No, so we're doing the study committee. Uh, oh, I see. It, this is the name of... I believe it's the name of the article, but dash study committee. This is a study committee part of that article. Okay, I know that's confusing, but we're voting just on the study committee portion of the main motion, which is essentially the Benson Stamps motion. Just the study committee portion. If you're in favor of the study committee, vote yes. If you're opposed to the study committee, vote no. Okay, let's close voting on the study committee. And it passes, 143 in the affirmative, 81 in the negative, and that's it. Now we're gonna take a vote 
on the moratorium part. And this will be the final, the tenth and final vote of motions under Article 12. There's no, there's no final vote. It's this is it. Once we vote all the parts, it's disposed of. So we'll now bring up. Uh, so if you're in favor of the moratorium that was defined in the Benson Stamps motion, then you would vote yes. Um, this is the text. Okay, so uh, yes. So this is the moratorium portion of Article 12. Do we, do we need that to say moratorium or? Okay, so listen to my voice. It is, the vote here is the moratorium part of the main motion, which was substituted from the Benson Stamps motion. That moratorium that ends at or around the 2024 annual town meeting, uh, if you're in favor of the moratorium for that roughly one year, vote yes. If you're against the moratorium, vote no. And this is the final vote under Article 12. Okay, let's close voting. And the moratorium fails. 106 in the affirmative, 122 in the negative, and one abstention. So the Article 12 is now disposed of. We've formed a study committee. We do not have a moratorium. Okay. We're overdue for a break, so let's now take a 10 minute break. And I'll see you back here at 10.07. Okay, we're going to resume. We will now take up Article 30, resuming Article 30. Ms. Deschler? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee and Town Meeting Member for Precinct 19. Mr. Moderator, I move that article, Articles 30 through 43 be taken from the table. We have a motion to take Articles 30 to 43 from the table. Do we have a second? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of removing those articles from the table, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. It is unanimous. Article 3 is now before us again. And so 30, 30, 30, 30. Um, so, uh, and just a reminder, this Article 30, we already got pretty far into debate uh, some time ago, and it got interrupted by a couple other articles. And so this is the zoning bylaw amendment for one and two family usable open space. And so uh, can we show and clear the speaker queue? We're going to start with this. Oh, we'll just clear it anyway. So can, can we clear it and we'll start over because I think folks didn't know. Okay, now open. There it is. Okay. And so we're going to pick up where we left off. Everyone remembers exactly what we've already discussed. Don't repeat what anyone's already said. Uh, and I will take uh, uh, Mr. Baudouin first. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Vincent Baudouin, Precinct 1. Uh, I want to thank my friend, Mr. Fleming, for the work that he has done on this article. Uh, we had an opportunity last week to hear arguments, and I don't wish to repeat them. Uh, since a week has passed, I, I just want to touch on a few points. First of all, usable open space is a requirement that a rectangle of space be left on a, open on a property, typically 25 feet on a side, uh, but that can be larger or smaller in some circumstances. There were some concerns about people paving their lots for parking. Mr. Champa, the Director of Inspectional Services, addressed this in the debate and in a subsequent memo posted to the annotated warrant. My reading of his clarification is that property owners can only create paved exterior parking if it is in a driveway, and in that case it is limited to 20 feet wide. There was an additional concern about this change impacting commercial properties. This was addressed in uh, another 
memo posted to the annotated warrant by Ms. Ricker, the Director of uh, Planning and Community Development. Um, and again, just my interpretation, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are other safeguards in place to protect businesses. It seemed unlikely that businesses would be replaced by single or two family houses because we removed this requirement. Uh, in addition, the memo pointed out ways that this change aligns with the goals of our master plan. Uh, finally, just a point about zoning broadly. When we make rules about what people can do with their property, we are balancing our desire to protect the community's interests against the freedom we are taking from people to choose what is best, the best use of their property. Um, so there are many very legitimate zoning rules that protect neighbors, including setbacks, lot coverage requirements, and landscaped open space requirements. Um, in, in my view, the balance here should swing towards letting property owners do decide whether or not a 25 foot by 25 foot square is the best way to use the space on, on their property. I hope you will join me in voting in favor of Article 30. Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll take. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lurdy, do you have a point of order? Mr. Lurdy, are you considering name in precinct? Uh, Chris Lurdy, precinct seven. I believe the rule in town meeting is if you're speaking for the second time, it's five minutes rather than seven. Are you considering that a number of these people on the list spoke last week? Uh, the town bylaws state, I don't know if Mr. Heim is here to confirm, but the town bylaws state that these rules apply per subject. And there is a loose interpretation of that, that we are speaking of a different subject because we've taken this up like a week later. And it, uh, uh, we did not have a means of tracking who had spoken the first time without sifting through the video. It would be a lot of effort to do that, and we had not done that. But uh, we'll take Mr. Rudick next. Mr. Rudick? Oh, I'm sorry. But that's fine. We'll, we'll get him next. Oh, if you're right there. Yep. Mr. Mr. Prokosh? Arthur Prokosh, Precinct 4. So, uh, to Mr. Bodwan's comments, um, I'd like to mostly just add that um, the complexity that we see in the, the zoning code today has real costs for our neighbors uh, in East Arlington. Um, my upstairs neighbors, a lot of other people that we've been hearing about as town meeting members in Precinct 4 um, have had issues, you know, you've got a, a baby on the way, are you going to uh, build or are you going to move? Um, and um, just, you know, that's a thousands of dollars, uh, could be a couple of years lead time on finding the right next house versus not having that lead time. Um, and, um, you know, as folks before me have said, and I believe uh, may say after me, uh, that the um, complexity here is um, simply, um, you know, what we're, what we're talking about at the change with Article 30 will be simplifying the zoning code uh, with very small and desirable side effects. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Mr. Rudick? Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. I move to terminate debate. Second. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate in very quick seconds. Uh, all those, we'll try a voice vote. Um, all those in favor of terminating debate on under Article 30, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? I say that's terminated. We have one standing, two, three, four. Five. Okay, let's go to an electronic vote. For termination of debate under Article 30. And we can, we can take the vote without clearing the queue, correct? Yeah. Okay, if you wish to terminate debate, vote one. If you wish to continue debate, press two. I will not be accepting any amendments. Ever again.
Okay, let's close voting. It passes. Uh, debate is terminated. 150 in the affirmative, 59 in the negative, three abstentions. So let's now move to a vote on the main motion. Can we do that? Go straight to it. Okay. Uh, before, before we open that voting, though, let me just summarize. Uh, it, is it about summarizing the vote or is it something else? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. This is a two-thirds vote because it is a zoning vote. I'm um, going to get that in, to that in the summary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a two-thirds vote. Vote yes. If you, want, if you wish to remove the usable open space requirement for one and two family uses from the zoning bylaw. There's a two-thirds vote. So let's now open voting on the main motion. Again, if you're in favor of removing the usable open space requirement for one and two family uses from the zoning bylaw, vote yes. If you want to leave the zoning bylaw, I don't want to say unamended, but not changed, then vote two for now. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails. 121 in the affirmative, 84 in the negative, three abstentions. Article 30 is disposed of. That brings us to Article 31. And as I mentioned at the opening, I'll be recusing myself because of my dog Mochi. And Mr. Oster will be taking the chair. Article 31 is before us. Uh, Ms. Embry, who is going to present the report of the board? Please go ahead. Thank you. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Article 31 is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to animal daycare uses in the industrial district inserted by Kristen Anderson. The board is supportive of adding animal daycare as a use and noted its particular suitability in the industrial district. The ARB voted four to zero at our April 3rd meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 31. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Kristen Anderson, the original proponent. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kristen Anderson. I'm a town meeting member representing Precinct 11 and I run a business in the industrial zone. Um, first, I just want to thank the uh, Redevelopment Board for voting unanimously in support of Article 31. Their support of this use change is greatly appreciated. During the lockdown period of the COVID-19 pandemic, many Arlington residents were forced to stay home. To remedy intense loneliness, many of our neighbors decided to welcome new pets into their homes. Now that pandemic restrictions have been lifted, people are going back into the office, leaving their pets at home. Many of these animals are very unhappy and suffer greatly from being home alone, particularly dogs. To the best of my knowledge, there exists in town only one animal daycare business, Go Play in Brattle Square. Go Play can offer this service because they are in the business zone and animal daycare is an allowed use in the business zone. However, Go Play has a small space with limited capacity and a very long wait list for new dogs. Arlington is in need of animal daycare. Robin from Robin's Nest Dog Grooming wanted to expand her business a few years back to offer doggy daycare. It would have required moving into a larger space and she found one in the industrial zone. But because the use was not allowed, she was not able to grow her business. Virginia for, from Potopia, another woman-owned local business, has already moved her business to Lexington, where there are more abundant commercial space offerings. Daria Panessi of Stratton Pup 
has been looking at spaces in Acton because she was not allowed to move into a space in the industrial zone on Dudley Street. In a letter to town meeting members, Daria Panessi states, quote, Arlington has become such a vibrant and diverse community over the years. I have seen the transformation firsthand and I love being a part of its fabric. So why is it that a small local business with a proven track record, trained staff, and eager clientele is being pushed out from the community we service and live in? Daria has grown Stratton Pup over the years. She now employs nearly 20 people <clears throat> and provides animal care services to over 300 area pooches. Daria would like to stay in Arlington, but this particular use restriction is pushing her out of town. This use restriction has had a negative impact on these women's ability to grow their businesses. The lack of, av of available space, excuse me, the lack of available space is forcing businesses out of Arlington. And worse, it is negatively impacting the residents of Arlington by denying them local services that they want. For doggy daycare, Arlington's pooches are mostly sent to Crate Escape in Belmont or they are sent to Burlington, Lexington, or Woburn. Arlington's residents should not have to travel outside of town to access animal daycare services. Local businesses provide services, products, and jobs to the community, which makes Arlington a more vibrant town. Local businesses help to make Arlington a town worth living in. Arlington needs to better support our businesses through zoning. We cannot grow our commercial base in town and realize any level of economic development without space for businesses. We have to do more to protect our existing and future businesses, and one small way that you can do that tonight is by voting yes for Article 31. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Rosenthal. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Um, first, let me say that I my inclination is to support this article. However, uh, Mr. What, assistant Moderator, is that the correct term? Um, I do find myself wondering, where did this restriction come from in the first place? Why do we even have it? For all I know, it may be something archaic that Maybe there's a legitimate reason, or it may be something from the 1800s that is completely irrelevant in the 21st century. Is there anybody here uh, who might have an answer to that? Uh, is there anyone from the uh, uh, redevelopment board or planning staff who can speak to that? Rachel Zemberry, chair of the redevelopment board. Uh, the industrial district uh, zoning regulations were actually passed by town meeting, uh, I believe, uh, two years ago. And uh, this was a use that uh, was simply not included in the, um, in the table of, of allowed uses at that time. Uh, the uses were identified uh, as a priority to be creative uses uh, that involved um, providing additional opportunities for benefits to the town in addition to traditional industrial activities. Thank you. So this is something that simply wasn't contemplated, so it was just an error of omission, is that correct? Uh, Rachel Zemberry, uh, Chair of the Redevelopment Board, uh, I believe you could characterize it as something that was not contemplated at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Moore. Ms. Ham. Leva High in Precinct 15, I move the question. Second. Okay, I'm gonna try a voice vote. Um, all those in favor of ending debate and voting immediately, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. I think the ayes have it. 
We'll proceed directly to a vote. It's a two-thirds vote to incorporate these changes into the zoning bylaw. Uh, vote yes. Excuse me. Vote yes if you want those changes to be made. Vote no if you do not. Have we started voting yet? Okay. Close voting, please. The motion passes. It's a two-thirds vote. I so declare it. Mr. Moderator, your chair is ready. Okay, that brings us to Article 32. Okay, and this, this was initially on the consent agenda. Uh, this was held by Ms. Mazina, and so first we'll introduce this article. Um, Ms. Zember, did you want to introduce the, uh, the, the vote from the Redevelopment Board, please? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Article 32 is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to building affordable housing anywhere, inserted by Tom Perkins. After meeting with the ARB, the petitioner requested to withdraw the proposal. The ARB voted 4 to 0 at our April 3rd meeting to recommend no action on Article 32. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mazina, you, you held this from the consent agenda. Did, did you? Pass. Pass. Okay. So. We have uh, a recommended vote of no action. Uh, we have no substitute motion. And so we have nothing to debate. There's no scope for debate. So we'll move straight to a vote on the main motion of no action. Let's do a voice vote. All those in favor of, of no action on article, under thir art article 32 say yes. Yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. We will do nothing. That takes us to Article uh, let's see, 33. Uh, now, this is a Finance Committee article. Uh, Ms. Deschler, do you want to introduce the Finance Committee's vote on this article? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, article 33, along with um, most of the following 20 or so articles, are articles that have been inserted in the warrant at the request of the Finance Committee. Most of these articles are articles that come up every year. Um, article 33 relates to the um, Parking Benefit District, which was created by town meeting in 2017 with the idea of uh, uh, parking meter money that's collected uh, be dedicated for improvements in that very area that generated the money. Um, through Article 33, uh, town meeting is being asked to endorse um, the, the expenditures from the anticipated revenue, um, which is $416,924, um, endorse the um, expenses from that um, that are listed in Article 33, and that includes administrative costs, um, cost of the parking enforcement in that district, parking meter operations themselves, and then the leftover for the um, center and plaza improvements, and the Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on Article 33. Thank you. And can we show the speaker queue? Uh, folks might not have known that. So we have three speakers here. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pooler, do you want to tell us something about this article? 
this, just so folks know, this article was uh, inserted into the warrant but at the request of the town manager. So I'll give Mr. Pooler an opportunity to say a few words. Sandy Pooler, town manager, I'm just going to make this comment because I was told by one of your members that if I didn't, uh, he would ask a question. So let's see if I can preempt that. Uh, I just wanted to speak to the uh, progress in replacing the meters in town. Uh, as many of you know, we are now not currently enforcing uh, parking uh, at meters other than for time limits because the meters don't work anymore. Uh, we have anticipated that we would have them repaired in five days. I think that's probably not true. Uh, we just heard today that they're uh, going to be shipped. So I think by the end of the month, they should be up and running again. Uh, notwithstanding that, um, we will have sufficient income this year and more than sufficient income in the coming year to meet the needs of the Parking Benefit District. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. We'll take Ms. Friedman first. That was the question. Okay, Mr. Moore? Pass. Mr. Jalkett? Okay, we have no more speakers. So let's proceed to a vote on the main motion. Just FYI, this was on the consent agenda, it was held. Um, so uh, let me summarize before we go into the voting. This is a majority vote, vote in your vote yes, if you want to endorse the expenditure of $416,924 in projected revenue from the parking fund for the four items detailed on page six of the Finance Committee's report. If you're in favor of endorsing that expenditure, you'd vote yes. And if you're against endorsing that expenditure, you'd vote no. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now open. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 207 in the affirmative, five in the negative. Um, it is an affirmative vote. Let's then move to Article 34. And can we, uh, let's, we'll open the speaker queue as we introduce it so we can get through these quickly, maybe. Uh, speaker queue is now open. Ms. Deschler, do you wanna introduce this? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, with respect to Article 34, the town receives uh, revenue from cable um, services and in return um, uh, spends money or uh, disperses money to support cable access television services. Uh, the Finance Committee uh, recommends a positive vote on 34. Thank you. Let's uh, now go to the speaker queue. Mr. White. Is Mr. White, uh, is Mr. White in the balcony? I don't see Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Leone? This was, just FYI, this was on the consent agenda and it was held. I'm not sure by whom, but Mr. Leone? Uh, John Leone, Precinct 8. I'm also the president of ACMI, ACME as I call it. Uh, Michael Ruderman, who's our treasurer, is here. We also have some other former board members Barbara Coster was an initial board member, and um, Charlotte Pierce was also a board member. Um, ACMI gets its funding from your cable bill. If you'll notice on your bill, there's a franchise fee for 5%. That's designated by the Federal Trade Commission to go to PEG Access, P-E-G, Public Educational Government. The only legitimate use for that under the federal rules is to give it to the local cable company for PEG which we use in Arlington to fund ACME, ACMI, which does the screens, which does this for us for um, cable television, does the school committee, does the select board, does all the other boards that we fund that are funded through this. So we're gonna ask you to just vote this up to two years ago. It automatically went through, but the Department of Revenue on the state changed their rules so that it had to become a vote of the town or the city to approve the budget item every year. So we kind of wish it hadn't come off because 
In the future, it's going to be here for every year. And if you'll notice, if you check the revenues that have come in over the last several years, they are going down. Um, it's from the cable cutters. All these people are cutting cable and going to streaming. It's directly affecting our budget. Um, we've lost almost $150,000, $170,000 over the last three years. So in a couple of years, we may have to come to the town to ask for additional money or some other funding, or we're going to have to cut the services we provide. So please provide, pass it this year, and let's hope that no more people cut their cable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leon. Cutting your cable is out of scope. Uh, do Mr. Kepline, did, did you want to speak? Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. I'm sorry I didn't have my finance report with me tonight. Um, I'm wondering if uh, someone could tell us how much money this is, uh, how much I, goes to salaries, how much goes to programs, um, and then uh, some information about the, um, the classes that are available to residents and students within Arlington schools. Uh, Ms. Deschler, do you have the answer to the first question about the, let's say to Mr. Kepline, because I'm not sure I caught everything, you might have to repeat it. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee, on page 7 in the Finance Committee report, uh, the amounts for operating expenses, salaries and taxes, um, and capital listed. As for programs, I, I can't answer that. Okay. Uh, could somebody tell me what kind of things? Um, Mr. Helmuth? Okay, could somebody um, maybe list out some of the services ACMI brings to the town and the value they provide, especially with, with courses for student, for residents and Mr. students? Mr. Leone, do you have an answer to that? ACMI provides invaluable, well, John Leone, Precinct 8, ACMI provides invaluable services to the town of Arlington. We provide the select board meetings for your watching benefit at home. We provide this for your watching benefit at home. We provide at the high school, we have a little sub studio that we use to train the um, students who wish to learn about audio visual and the latest technologies for cable casting, for broadcasting. We also provide training for interns from some of the various colleges in the area. Our studio and our training is highly sought after among colleges, and those colleges send children to Arlington. We also provide training for the high school kids and the middle school children in the latest um, television cameras, latest technology, latest editing. Right back here, um, right opposite the men's room, we have a studio. It's a satellite studio that directs, connects up to our studio up the heights at the old Dallin Library. And we also have another sub-studio in the Food Link building on um, Summer Street that provides um, additional training for the high school children. And also from that studio, we can transport equipment down to the football field, the basketball field, the soccer, and to, to uh, cable cast those games for the parents who can't make it down to, these, um, to, the, to the event. Um, and we do other things as well. We have to be careful on when we try, we can't really broadcast all of like the student plays that they have every year because of copyright laws. So we, we have to, Norm does a good job of, Norm McLeod, our executive director who's been there since 2006, he does a good job of keeping us straight. Okay, and the news broadcasts, and you have educational programs for adults too, right? Yes, we do. Um, anybody can come down and become a member. I believe the membership fee is forty dollars. Fifty, Mike? fifty bucks. Last fifty dollars. Okay, it's fifty bucks. Um, and if you can't afford it, we make an accommodation for you. So we'll train anybody on how to use the equipment, meaning the cameras. The um, we have drones. They can use the drones. We'll train them how to use it, uh, and then the editing student and editing suites. We'll train you how to use the suites, so you can do a program. So you, whatever you want to do, you can do it. 
if it's a purient interest, we're going to show it at 2 o'clock at night so we don't offend anybody, but we have to show it. Um, <laughs> the FCC makes us show everything that anybody comes up with. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take Mr. Moore next. Is it invaluable or is it valued at $820,000 and $477? It's okay. I'm just kidding. Mr. Moore? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. Uh, motion to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate under Article 34 say yes. Yes. All those opposed? The yeses have it. T debate is terminated. Let's go to a vote on the main motion under Article 34, which is before, actually before we switch over, let me summarize. Uh, this is a majority vote and vote yes if you wish to endorse the expenditure of $820,000, $820,477 in projected cable revenue detailed on page seven of the Finance Committee's report. If you're in favor of endorsing that expenditure, you vote yes. If you're against it, vote no. Uh, let's open voting now on the main motion of Article 34. I think the green light's on, but we don't have a vote screen yet. Oh, there we go. Voting is open. Okay, let's close voting. And the article passes 209 in the affirmative, one in the negative. Uh, the motion passes and Article 35 has been disposed of. 34 has been disposed of, sorry. Uh, I'll go to Article 35, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, uh, Article 35 relates to reclassification of positions. Reclassification is the process by which a town employee's job description and or salary is adjusted to reflect their actual job responsibilities. The process begins with the employee and the department head um, filing an application for reclassification to the director of HR who examines the job description, compares it with similar descriptions in 12 nearby towns, and decides whether the um, uh, job should be reclassified. If reclassification is denied, the employee is entitled to appeal to a three-person appeals board. Positions that are reclassified are presented to town meeting as we have done um, to you in our report on page eight under article 35. Actually, just one second, sorry for the interruption. Can we clear and show the speaker queue uh, while Ms. Deschler speaks? Okay, thank you. Ms. Deschler, sorry for the interruption. Certainly, Mr. Moderator. The positions reclassified are listed on pages eight and nine of the Finance Committee report, where the Finance Committee is, is asking for a positive vote to um, endorse the, the classification plan as amended, and also for an appropriation of $5,043 to cover the adjustments by these reclassifications. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have Mr. Loretti in the speaker queue. Mr. Loretti, you are recognized to speak. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I was I'm just wondering if someone could explain um, what some of these abbreviations mean, like NTP versus OA. And, and if there's not, and there isn't much change in the appropriation, what's the, the purpose of the reclassification? Uh, Mr. Pooler, can you answer that? Sandy Pooler, town manager. Those are uh, indications of both union and non-union positions. Uh, so uh, the uh, O's are part of the ASME. Uh, MTP is a non-union position. Uh, I'm trying to see what the other ones are, but those are all uh, just designations of uh, where people fit in the unions or in the non-union positions. Thank you. Uh, just one other question there, if I may, Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Does the higher number um, after the grade indicate that it has a, it tops out at a higher salary? Is that what that is for? Sandy Pooler, town manager. Each of those uh, classifications has a range of steps that they go through. Each step, uh, you go up one a year. 
Um, and so if you go from grade six to grade seven, you will be, uh, grade seven is paid more than grade six, and then you would go up uh, the step system. Most of these jobs have eight steps. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newton? Okay, we have no more speakers. So let's proceed to a vote on the main motion. And before we bring that up, I'll summarize that this is a majority vote and you can vote yes, voting yes will we'll amend the classification plan and the town bylaws by reclassifying 12 positions, appropriating $5,043 corresponding to those reclassifications, adding 10 positions and deleting five positions. You can read the details in the vote language. Uh, so let's now open voting on the main motion under Article 35. Okay, voting is now open, I believe. Okay, let's close voting. The motion passes 208 in the affirmative, one in the negative. Article 35 is disposed of. It takes us to Article 36. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Article 36 asks town meeting to appropriate $570,357 into a salary reserve fund to be set aside for future collective bargaining agreements. To rat it also asks Tommy to ratify the recent collective bargaining ag agreement with SEIU to appropriate from the salary reserve fund $41,026 to pay for FY23 salary increases associated with the agreement and to appropriate $129,643 to pay for FY23. 24 salary increases. The Finance Committee um, recommends a positive vote. Great, thank you. Can we clear and show the speaker queue? Okay. Seeing no requests to speak, uh, let's proceed to a vote on the main motion after I summarize the vote that Ms. Dashley just described. This is the majority vote. And you can vote yes to appropriate $570,357 to be set aside for funding future collective bargaining agreements, transfer $41,026 from the existing salary reserve to FY 2023 budgets, increase other FY 24 budgets by $129,643, and ratify financial items in the collective bargaining agreements with the Service Employees International Union Local 888. Um, so let's open a vote now. If you're in favor of all those things, vote yes, one for yes, two for no. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes. 206 in the affirmative, five in the negative. Article 36 is disposed of. That takes us to Article 39, which is a no action article. Ms. Deschler, I think this will be quick. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Since no appropriations are transferred, Transfers are required at this time. Uh, the Finance Committee had a no action vote on Article 39. Great, and thank you. And I, I have, uh, do you have a point of order or? Okay, point of order. Uh, behind Mr. Loretti, who is it? Oh, can you speak into the microphone so we can? Nancy Bloom, please, in 18. Uh, the screen has 36 before I, it, but I think it's right now. 
Okay, thank you. So yes, it's Article 39. And so I, we don't have a substitute motion. We have a recommended vote of no action. Mr. Reddy, do you have a point of order? It was, it was held. <laughs> At least according to my records, right? Correct? Yeah, so um, let's take no further time disposing of this no action article, please. Um, all those in favor of no action, which is the main motion under Article 39, uh, say yes. Yes. All those opposed to no action, it is unanimous that we're taking no action under Article 39. Uh, that brings us to Article 40, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, the Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, in a previous town meeting, you were asked to authorize borrowing for water meter installations. That project is now completed and there is $300,000 in unissued debt that is no longer required. The Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on Article 40 to rescind this prior borrowing authorization and get it off our books. Okay, thank uh, Second to what? Um, uh, let's take Ms. Carlton Keeson first. Pass. Uh, Ms. Mandel? Pass. Uh, Mrs. Mara? Pass. Mr. Newton? Pass. Mr. Loretti? Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Chris Ferretti, Precinct 7. Um, I do have a question about the water meter uh, installation program. Um, I hope you'll deem appropriate. If this um, installation program has been deemed complete, there was a plan to make all of the data available for these new meters available to town residents. Will that still happen, or will the recension of this budget means, mean that is no longer going to happen? Mr. Pooler, can you answer that? whether the rescinding of this authority affects those terms. Sandy Pooler, town manager, the rescission of uh, this prior authorized debt does not affect uh, the program that we will implement once uh, we've completed all of the meter changeouts of allowing you to see your use in real time. Thank you, Ms. Mother. Thank you. Seeing no more speakers, we will go to a vote on the main motion, which I'll briefly summarize. This is a majority vote, and vote yes to rescind the authority to borrow $300,000 of unissued debt previously authorized at the 2014 town meeting. Um, and yeah, so let's open voting. Voting is now open. And this is a majority vote. Yes, yeah, so I just saw a bunch of speakers show up in the queue, so something happened. So we're going to reset. Oh, and it says 41. It should be 40. This is the wrong title. Yep. It should be 40 rescind borrowing authorizations from prior years. While we're waiting, does anyone have any amendments? Just kidding. Okay, looks like we're good to go, right? Okay. Voting is now open on Article 40. Vote yes to rescind the authority to borrow $300,000 of unissued debt previously authorized at the 2014 town meeting as recommended by the treasurer. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 202 in the affirmative, one in the negative. Do we have any motions to adjourn at this point? Oh, before we do that, yes, thank you. Before we do that, uh, do we have any notices of reconsideration? Ms. Deschler? Uh, 
I believe that was all the finance articles we had tonight, correct? Those, we, we have notices of reconsideration on those. Seeing no other notices of reconsideration, um, which I'm glad to see because it's complicated with division. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? All those in favor of adjourning, say yes. All those opposed, we're adjourned. <laughs>